Welcome to Exploring the Mystical Side of Life with your host, Linda Lang. Hi, this is Linda Lang from ThoughtChange.com. We are exploring the mystical side of life once again this week. If you enjoy our conversations, make sure you subscribe, share it with a friend. Today, I have the Empowerment Psychic with me, Walter Zajac. Welcome, Walter. Thank you. It's just so, such a pleasure to be here, Linda. Thank you. It's nice to meet you, actually. <laughs> well, I'm very excited about our conversation. I love talking to psychics that have grasps of the unseen world and information that many people maybe don't necessarily know how to access. I think we all can access it, but we don't always know how to. Yes. You know, my basic philosophy is that every major religion on our planet and pretty much every tribal religion has some form of two basic principles. Number one, we were created in the image and likeness of the creator. And secondly, that this creator gave us absolute free will. So the creator is, among other things, all knowing. And so at the very least, we have the potential to be all knowing, which is psychic information we have the potential and i think you're saying the same thing that if you choose to open up to it it's there we all have the capacity absolutely absolutely now today we're talking about deja vu which is something that most of us have had that experience before but for those who really don't know what we're talking about why don't we start at the basics Deja vu, the way I understand it is, it's a vision or a dream coming true. It is French. <laughs> and in French, it means it's something along the lines of at this place again. This can be like a premonition sleep dream, but it can be like a waking awareness as well. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's why I say vision too. And in my case, both have happened. I have had hundreds of dreams and visions come true. And at one point when I realized that was happening, um, I read a book about how, how to remember your dreams. And that is to keep a pad and pen or a pencil by your nightstand. And the moment you wake up, even if it's 3.30, write it down then, because if you wait, you'll forget the details or forget it completely. And I did that for many years and then realized, oh, gosh, that's that one. And that's this one came true and this one. So it was amazingly powerful to experience and to realize that I was getting that much information just automatically without trying. And at the same time, at some point, I stopped. I stopped keeping track of it because I realized, well, I'm living in the future rather than rather than now. I'm always worried about what's going to happen or excited about what's going to happen rather than just living now. We have to live now in order to create the steps that lead to that dream. And here's something fascinating that maybe other people in your audience have experienced. And that is frequently when I realized a dream was coming true, if it had been a dream that really scared me. I realized as it was coming true that it's not nearly as bad as I thought it was, because when I dreamt it, I was just suddenly put into that awareness, whereas in life, I did step by step leading up to it, and I understood, and this is okay, I can handle it, All right? And then I'm giving that information to people so that they're not afraid of their dreams coming true, to know that you're still in control no matter what. The second precept is you have been given absolute free will. Now, I've had some dreams that have come true as well, and they're not always, what I say, maybe like a literal, they're like an experience in a dream that's kind of symbolic. I like to interpret my dreams, and lo and behold, maybe a week, two weeks, maybe a month later, it's like something happens, I'm like, oh my God, this is that dream. This is that dream. And it's so interesting to me that your unconscious mind and your higher self will work together to bring you the message, but it might not look exactly like your dream when it actually happens in real life. Right. Symbols. Um, the symbols, as I'm having the dream, 
the symbols are based on my life experience so far. For instance, I thought a series of dreams was happening in Seattle because I thought I recognized the Space Needle in Seattle. Well, it turned out that whole series of dreams was happening in Frankfurt, Germany, where there is a television tower that looks pretty much like the Space Needle, right? And I lived close to it. And, you know, so symbols, we base it. And then also symbols of, I don't believe that you can actually write a book that would give a universal explanation of symbols and dreams, because what I've realized is for every one of us, the symbols are, the meaning of the symbols is all about what they mean to us. For instance, a bear, right? For me, a bear is just about as scary as, could, as, it, as it could possibly be, but other people may have a completely different impression of a bear. Maybe they've even interacted, worked at a zoo, you name it, right? And so if a bear comes to them in their dream, it's a completely different symbol than the meaning that the bear has to me. Yeah, I have the perfect example of that. And that that is the mountain, the mountain, because for so many people, that means, you know, being at the top, being at the pinnacle, you know, the world is their oyster. And I'm one of those people that a mountain means burden. Burden. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a mountain to climb, right? Things, things you have to do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's fascinating. Now you had a really interesting experience. I wrote a book <laughs> about it. It is called They Came. The subtitle is Beyond Deja Vu, because that's literally what happened. It was beyond the dreams coming true. I had, uh, first of all, uh, um, the book begins in, in uh, 11 years after World War II had ended in post-war Germany and Devastation at the end of the war was phenomenal because the Nazis were just out of control. And so the Americans and British had to do devastation. And my city was uh, about 90% leveled. The end of the war population went from 236,000 down to 50,000 in six years. And even 11 years after the war, half the city was still bombed out shells of buildings and rubble. And obviously, a very poor country. I did not know that my mother had been sick for a year, was dying of cancer. Everybody else in the family knew. I did not know. I was told I was going to go on a really exciting train ride, and I was so pumped about it. I get to do stuff that the older kids don't get to do in the family. And then at the end of a train ride with a Red Cross lady, I was taken, walked through the countryside and arrived at a place called Orphanage, which was a word I had never heard before. And I was told, you're never going home again. And it was just as about as devastating as anybody could imagine. Complete loss of power, complete loss of control, and unbelievable. Suddenly, the physical world became unbearable and unbelievable. Plus, I got beat up twice that night. And it was, you know, people can imagine in an orphanage, you don't get a lot of positive attention, right? You're one of the kids, and they have a lot to handle. But what's fascinating, what the book is basically about, what you're alluding to, is I had two imaginary friends before the orphanage, two imaginary friends with whom I interacted regularly and in detail. Um, the first of them was, uh, I call her the accident girl. Her name is Maria in the book. I saw over and over what I originally thought was a movie, but it turned out this was a vision. I had fallen asleep in the movie theater with my brother. The vision was seeing her interacting with her family. And you know how when you see somebody in a movie, you, you fall in love with the character. And I did. She was a teenage girl and just her parents loved her and she was happy. And she went in on a uh, trip with her father in a um, big semi truck that had a huge load of freight in the back. They got in a horrifying accident. Her face was dis disfigured, otherwise injured. I saw the details of her floating above her body in the truck cabin, floating above her body in surgery. I went with her to Beyond the Light. And it's something that Dr. Raymond Moody, one of the uh, foremost researchers on near-death experiences, has been researching about the last 10 years, and that is shared near-death experiences, where you go with somebody else on their near-death experience and experience it with him. And with them, I went to that world, and you can tell by my emotions now. It's just overwhelming in, in the most beautiful, blissful, blissful possible way you could imagine. I went there. Then, boom, defibrillator. 
I was back with her and watched that happen. And then I saw when the bandages came off and she threw the mirror down and screamed, why did you let me live? I look like a monster. I saw all of that in detail over and over and over. And I interacted with her because in her trauma, utterly alone, nobody was there for her. And in my trauma, utterly alone, we related, right? And so we're talking flying to the clouds and just being with me in front of me. And of course, the, the obvious deduction here is I lived most of my time in the psychic world because the physical world was just unbearable. Now, how old were you when, when six. You, you were six. six years old? Yeah, yeah. And um, devastated because I had been super close to my mother. Um, she didn't work. I wasn't in school yet. We spent our days together and then she didn't even say goodbye. So I turned to the psychic world for this companionship. Then, when I was 44, I actually met both of these imaginary friends in real life. They became real people in my life. And when they were my imaginary friends, they, neither of them had been born yet. It was 15 years before both, both of them were born. That's pretty cool. Now, you didn't tell us about the other one. That the other one was uh, one where I also saw her traumatic event. And when I met her in person, I was able to tell her things that she had never told anybody else. I was able to describe exactly where she lived, what that family was like, the one that she lived with, and what it looked like. I had seen it in visions and dreams, and then I had actually um, rode past there in a streetcar in Frankfurt a few times and saw it and felt her, right? But the accident girl, I had been speaking to her. Um, the first, I had a successful music career for 28 years, and I was good at that. I could be very comfortable and confident behind a drum set, but in social life, especially one-on-one -on -one with a girl, I was a mess, had no, no confidence. And I had been speaking to this girl, calling in prices to a company where she worked she was the receptionist, beautiful voice, always, you know, one moment, please. And it just always touched me when she spoke, right? And then one day after three years, I made her laugh. And I'm sure people in the audience know when we make somebody laugh, we connect. We just connect souls, right? And in those moments, you know, and, and, and again, people in the audience have had the experience where you meet somebody and you just feel like, oh, my God, I've known you all my life. I know you, right? We both felt that. I didn't recognize her as my imaginary friend. She didn't recognize me as anything, never did, other than, oh, I know you, oh, I know you, right? And so we started speaking um, socially that day, <laughs> then every day. And, and this was a phone relationship because she, she lived in another city. And after a few weeks, she said, I have to confess something to you. I was in a horrifying accident. My face got really disfigured. I've had 17 operations and, and otherwise injured. and she started telling me the accident, the story of the accident, and about halfway through, I finished the story for her in detail, in detail. And then over the next few weeks, I told her five things that she had never told another human, including those things that I mentioned above her body in the truck cabin in surgery, the beyond the light, and the day the bandages came off. She had never told those things to another human. And so that was amazing. And she never did recognize me the, the way I did as, oh my gosh, you're my imaginary friend. And at some point I mentioned that to her. And, and just knowing these things that I knew, the, I knew things that she had never told anybody, very quickly, it became creepy to her. Creepy, you know, like, who is this guy? And she literally said, I mean, you might be crazy. You might be crazy. I can't do this anymore. And that was about as devastating as that first day at the orphanage. What, what was beautiful about it, and this is what the book's about, how I find my way out of that, and there's another aspect, but it was the very thing that made me realize what friends had been telling me for years, and they're just, dude, you need some help, <laughs> right? Because what I had gone through, friends would say, how could you possibly handle that alone? Of course you need some help. And I had denied it. I got this. I got this, right? And it was mostly because I didn't want to relive it. I, you know, barely made it through the first time. Don't want to relive it. And I think a lot of people can relate to, relate to that. We avoid psychological help. I found a psychologist and she happened to be, happens to be, still is, <laughs> 
the daughter of a Toltec shaman. And many people know Toltec shaman is the writings of Don Juan. Don Juan Matus was a Toltec shaman. Carlos Castaneda, who wrote those books, became a Toltec shaman in the process of writing them. Um, the Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. He's a Toltec shaman. It's a shamanic tradition in Central and South America that goes back thousands of years, maybe 10,000 ancient wisdom that is just powerful as heck. And my psychologist, Venita is her name, she's okay with me talking about her, um, was, she, since her father was a shaman, she was going to other realities and other worlds and experiencing stuff that was just way beyond belief. When I told her my story in our first session, she said, that's nothing compared to what I've seen. That's nothing. You're not crazy, you're psychic. You're psychic, and what you did was you found two people who weren't even born yet in the psychic world who would become real people in your life, who would then cause you to not avoid help anymore, cause you to heal. And the thing she brought to me, which I bring to all my clients now, is loving little Walter. Loving little Walter. When we're five years old, six years old, and younger, we are just precious and innocent and sweet as we can be. And we're wise because we're still in tune with where we came from, which was the spirit world. And we want nothing more than just to be loved. And that ceased, seems to also be universal. None of us get enough love growing up, right? And so... Loved and give love too, right? Yes. But when she helped me, and I put it off a long time, I didn't want to feel all that stuff, right? But when she took me, and it's something I do with clients now, she put little Walter on my lap and had me hold him and feel him. And, and, and like in NLP, you know this because you're an NLP practitioner too. Bringing in all the senses makes it a real experience, right? And then when she said, tell him how you feel. Tell him I love you, little Walter. And the moment I was able to say that about three times, I burst out crying and I felt him. I felt him. And that's when I realized, oh my God, I was beautiful. And then she connected those dots Einstein said over 100 years ago, there is no time. And it's been proven scientifically, experimentally ever since. And so little Walter still actually exists, right? And then when I felt him, I realized, oh, that's me. That's me. That's who I am. And she kept pointing that over and over and over. That's who you are. And that, that self-love was my healing. The real healing was just realizing that I wasn't a piece of crap that nobody wanted and sent to an orphanage. I was beautiful. And all of us are. Wow. What a story, Walter. What a story. Thank you. It really goes to show how interconnected we all are, really. That, you know, that little six-year-old boy could have an imaginary friend, two friends, actually, that are actual beings and not just imaginary. So it, it, it really does make one wonder about all the children out there who have imaginary friends. Yeah. And my feeling and understanding from tuning into people's worlds for as a professional for almost 20 years is more often than not, what these kids are experiencing is real. It's real. It is real, you know, and Gosh, quantum physics, which is, I've read three books on quantum physics. Uh, one of my favorites is the holographic universe. If anybody's interested in how the universe really works, it's built like a hologram and I don't want to go into it. But quantum physics says that reality, physical reality is an illusion. It's something that we're making up. There are no physical particles there are no quantum particles until somebody looks and when we look we're creating them and we're creating them with our influence we make them look the way we believe they're going to look so anything that we're creating is first of all 99.9999 percent empty space in terms of physical reality and it's only physical when we create it physically otherwise it's just frequencies and yeah all those frequencies are interconnected I'm whispering <laughs> for dramatic effect. <laughs> it's really about learning how to create those particles more consciously. So they're actually what we want to experience, right? Yeah. And then I think you know this because you're all about empowering your clients and because you had to find your own power, what you went through with healing yourself from the cancer in your leg as a it's so Im Im inspiring and powerful and moving and i know you bring that energy to your your clients and 
the thing, and I think I would notice it on your website too. Gratitude is the magic for creating those beautiful moments. If you can find something to be grateful about, about that person or the situation, then it decreases your fear or pain and or um, makes it a better experience and opens your heart. And usually when we open our heart, the other person, even if they're in conflict with us right now, they'll open their heart a little bit more too. And we have a better moment, if not maybe finding a solution, right? Gratitude. Yeah, the, uh, the whole energetic kind of action reaction relationship shifts when one person shifts it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So how did you go from Walter, who thought maybe he was a little bit insane, so he went to get some help and you went through the process with your ear therapist, uh, the Toltec wisdom, thank goodness, like even that shows you that the universe supports you, right? Like that, that's where you ended up. Yes. How did you end up becoming an actual psychic that that's how you earn your living? First by my psychologist repeating it regularly, you know, repeating to me that I used my psychic ability to take care of myself, first of all, to bring companionship to the orphanage because I had almost nobody else in the orphanage, and then to cause my healing, to unavoidably cause my healing. I couldn't, couldn't put it off anymore. It was in your face. <laughs> but the second thing was, let's see, it was about, uh, right before 9-11 in 2001, August. My girlfriend at the time bought me my very first psychic reading. It was for an hour with a tarot card reader. And the last card that she pulled in the tarot cards was the magician, which was the outcome. And her interpretation of that was, well, oh, Walter, this is who you are. Right? And if people know the tarot cards, the magician is the one who was able to take source energy and manifest it into physical, no matter what you know, just in tune with everything and able to manifest what he or she wants. And she said, you're psychic and you need to do that for a living. You will change the lives of so many people and it will really benefit you. And so um, she helped me. We stayed in tune. We hit it off, stayed in touch, I should say. And about six months later, she helped get me set up on a service and then with six months later than that, I developed it to my own website. And that was almost 20 years ago. And I've been doing it full time ever since. Fantastic. And you call yourself the empowerment psychic because it's more than just getting a reading. Yeah. I, you know, and I've noticed this with some psychics, famous psychics. Uh, Sylvia Brown was one where I would hear her do readings for people. And she would say, you're going to meet a guy named Steve and it's not going to work out and you're going to be really unhappy. And I would think, really? That's all you're going to give them, right? You're not going to help her make it better for herself, right? And so what I do in psychic readings is, okay, I'll talk about you're going to meet this guy, and it's going to be real difficult, a huge challenge, and here's why he's messed up from childhood and et cetera, et cetera, when what he's gone through. But here's how you can help Steve find a way to love you, right? And I don't necessarily hear the name Steve some people hear that, but I think that's rare. Um, I just see you're going to meet this guy and I'll see, I'll see a personality. And I tend not to even see races because everybody's the same inside. Yeah. And it's so fulfilling to be able to help people. Uh, and if I hadn't gone through trauma uh, after a year at the orphanage, I was adopted by an American military couple who were abusive. Within a few weeks after arriving at their home, I was getting spanked so severely on my bare bottom that it drew blood every time, drew blood. And then it got worse from there, just abuse for the next 11 years. And I realized that if I hadn't experienced that and recovered from it, just like you did with your own stuff, you know, both not just the physical, but emotionally, right, that, that this was your, your, your spirit was screaming at you, you wrote on your website, right? And I realized that if I hadn't gone through all of that, I couldn't help anybody. I would be useless. I would just be entertainment, right? Well, nice story, Walter, right? But if I hadn't really gone through it, and then that was also one of my goals in writing the book was to help other people. Well, I've realized in my work, and then just you watch the news and meet people, 
almost everybody has some kind of a traumatic experience. Almost everybody I've ever met has some really deep-seated pain that they need help getting over. So for me, when I'm able to really help somebody, it's the most fulfilling, beautiful experience of my life. And when I look back at all the trauma and hardship that I endured, I wouldn't change it for the world because I wouldn't know what I know. I wouldn't be wise enough to help anybody. Yeah, it's true. They often say that uh, a lot of the psychic skill comes out of being in a very challenging situation. Yeah, and isn't that how it happened for you, right? You, you need to have that sixth sense, right? You need to have that sixth sense. So Walter, for any of the listeners that have had deja vu experiences, whether that dream or awakening, what kind of insight or guidance would you give them? Listen, and I'm sure you've noticed it too. I have noticed that the primary, the, the, the largest block of information that I get in, in psychic information is the feelings. And then, you know, uh, <laughs> it's a big shift from recognizing that you're psychic to being psychic on demand. Somebody calls and, oh, I have to be psychic now. What? <laughs> so I went to seminars from famous psychics and just, you know, develop, okay, how do you do this? And the thing that really stood out, and I know you know this too, is go with the very first thing that comes to you. The very first thing, no matter how illogical it seems, because the second, third, and fourth things you've changed with your sense of logic, with your fears, with your desires, with your prejudices, you, you name it, right? The very first thing is the accurate information. And so that's the advice I would give to people. And my goodness, if you're realizing that I've been here before, right? And if you really want to know, then yeah, keep a pad and pen by your bed. And the moment you wake up, write down what you just dreamt, whether it's 3.30 at night or next thing in the morning, write it down exactly then, exactly at that time, because otherwise you'll forget details or forget it completely. So what would you say, Walter, about people that have reoccurring dreams? Just like if you keep seeing the numbers 111 over and over, 111, 111. It's a message from whatever you believe, your higher self, your angel guides, and the re reoccurring dream is the same thing. Pay attention to this. Pay attention to this. Figure out these symbols. What does this mean to you? How does this make you feel? Yeah, I guess maybe if it's reoccurring, you haven't got the message yet, right? Exactly. That's why it's reoccurring. And that's why we, for instance, keep seeing numbers over and over. One, 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 three, three, three. Yeah. So much fun chatting with you today, Walter. Thank you. Been a good time. Thank you, Linda. Let's share your book again and your contact information. Okay. The book is called They Came Beyond Deja Vu. My website is psychicwalter.com. And on the website, there is a free self-love meditation, 15-minute MP3 with theta waves and um, subliminal uh, affirmation tracks. And it's powerful, people say. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for listening to this week's edition of Exploring the Mystical Side of Life. You will find all of our conversations on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Anchor.fm. Come visit me at ThoughtChange.com. Learn what energy medicine can do for you. It's time to bring a little magic into your life. That's it for this week. We'll see you again next time. Bye for now.